Welcome back to the Stag Raw Podcast. This is episode 310. It's another one from the Seeker Show, so you will hear the ambience of the Mystery Creek uh, event theatre, warehouse, building, <laughs> going on the absolute harm. We were at the NZDA stand and managed to take Jeremy McLaughlin away from the Bloodline Gear stand where he was uh, deep in yarns with many hunters, as they love to do over there. The guys at Bloodline, um, they prioritise having good yarns, getting out there into the wilderness as part of their core values, and that will never change. Um, they love exploring the gnarliest parts of New Zealand, and any trip to the Southern Alps is guaranteed to be an adventure. One icy cold mission, they admired the snow-capped scenery, knowing that every Kiwi should be out there enjoying it. Um, however... They know that the odd hunting gear, it's not cheap, it costs some serious tin and that's why they provide a range of hunting gear that's high quality, merino, but affordable so that more legends can enjoy the New Zealand landscape in their remote paradise while in comfort. Um, the end result is gear for hunters by hunters. And if you'd like to check out what jared has been up to, head over to his YouTube channel. Um, I recently enjoyed his beautiful Fjord and Wapiti expedition. It was really cool. Um, we have a good yarn about that. Um, there's some high country now, some stuff in there. There's some tar hunting in there. Um, it's bloody cool. I think Bloodline Gear as well. They've got a YouTube channel also. Yeah, it's neat stuff. So make sure you're following that little ecosystem of Jared and Bloodline Gear um, on Instagram and check out their website. Get yourself some of their amazing merino gear. Um, I think Cam. Um, from the Hunter's Journal was talking about one of their sleeping bag liners as well the other day. I saw they sold out of those post the Seeker Show, so you obviously um, enjoyed getting your hands on it, feeling it, seeing it in action, and uh, going home and and putting your money where your mouth is, so that out on the hills you can keep nice and cool and and uh, not have the stank that you get with artif artificial uh, materials. I love wearing uh, merino out on the hill. Um, and also out, out on runs, that's something Jared and I talk about. So anyway, without further ado, make sure you're following. Um, hopefully you can share this out with your friends. It was amazing, the response we got back from that Hunter's Journal podcast. So, uh, Sorry, not Hunter's Journal, the Hunter's Club podcast. Um, we spoke about the Hunter's Journal a little bit. Um, and yeah, share it out with your friends. Uh, leave leave a rating, subscribe to the podcast. We, we ticked up a few more of those on Facebook and, and on the podcast platforms, Spotify. Um, yeah, it just helps more people hear more awesome stories of more people living life less ordinary and helps to uh, really give you, the listener, that boost to go out there and chase whatever dreams it is that you've got. Uh, give you some awesome examples of people doing amazing things. Um, super lucky to have the opportunity to just sit up there at the NZDA stand, pick a few brains, um, hear a few stories and, and tell a few yarns and I hope you're enjoying it. Um, of course, we've got the big game records of Red Deer going at the moment as well. Um, and then the back catalogue of the Wapiti and the Moose, the Seeker, the Fallow, the Whitetail, the Rusa, and the Samba. Um, of course, I think there's only the the Tar and the Shamwa to come. So, yeah, make sure you subscribe. There's plenty here on the Stag Raw podcast. Not all hunting, um, but there's plenty of hunters if that's what you're into. Right, without further ado, let's get into this episode with Jared McLaughlin from Bloodline Gear. Tech stuff here, Jared. The iPad. Yeah. I just had Dave from um, Hunters Club and I just felt pretty embarrassed to be rocking an iPad, but it does the job. <laughs> 1080p, you know, yep. 60 frames per second. Yeah, nice one. What are you rocking on the mountains? Um, in terms of camera gear. Camera gear. We just talked to Joe. Like, you'd be uh, running his sort of rig. Oh, I don't <laughs> know about that, man. That's a pretty big price ticket, eh, when you start getting into that realm. Yeah. Um, I'm just running some basic stuff, man. Yeah. I've just got, uh, like, an old school Canon SX60 that I use for the animal footage. Yeah. And then the old cheeky GoPro. Yeah. And then uh, Santa, uh, Sony um, 6300 for sort of the stills and yeah. like some nice... And you got a phone clothes. scope or...? I don't, man, no. but I think I'll probably go that route, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I reckon just because then I can cut away um, uh, with using the SX60 because yeah. it's quite bulky and quite heavy, so... 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's lads you're in uh, Wapiti country with. Did you uh, allow the music? What was, what was the go there? What was that with? <laughs> to play the music. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that um, that area, we had been in there for probably four or five days, so yeah. we seen it just run a mark in there. So we were pretty much songs on, tunes a party. cranking while we were uh, packing up our gear to blow on out to another basin. Yeah. So that's your first time in there, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. we had uh, 2020. Uh, we were period two uh, into the Worsley, but uh, obviously something happened that year. Something happened that yeah. year, so <laughs> we didn't get in there. And then I had a block the following year, and then two weeks out, my mate dislocated his knee. That's no good. Can't go in there like that. No, <laughs> no. So that was the end of that, um, and then managed to get in. Yeah. Uh, this year, so it was it was awesome, eh? And yeah. what what did you do to prepare mentally for that sort of stuff? I guess you've, you've gone tar and things like that. You, you're into the mountain tops up north of the South Island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I guess hunting for a few years, I'd kind of already thought about it and built myself up to being ready to go in there because I didn't want to go in there when I wasn't ready because you either won't enjoy it or you get into a bad situation, I guess. So, mm. Yeah. Shit bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, especially the lads I was with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were fit. Well, that sort of second last day, you went one way, they went the other way, and you sort of watched them scour a real, you know, pokey out spur that looked pretty steep, and then you had them up the top of it glassing with no time it was ridiculous <laughs> no i like because their route because moving around the like just the general bush down there is not easy yeah and they moved down through the scrub and then back up uh this face through this nasty stuff and i was like expecting them to probably be like a third of the way up and i couldn't see them yeah so i was like oh, i'll have a look to it's see bush edge yeah yeah <laughs> and then, then there they were sitting there and i was like what so, yeah, they got up there pretty quick. Yeah, and did they report back? They just ripped and bust up there? or Yeah, so we, we didn't have any radios or anything like that. So we basically um, we had a plan to meet back down at a campsite that we'd stayed at the first night. So mm -hmm. we rendezvoused, rendezvoused back down in the valley later that evening. And, yeah, they did a big loop. And, yeah, I, to be honest, I think yeah, I would have definitely held them up Mm -hmm. If I had followed them up there, so I wanted to check out another basin. So uh, it was kind of, I guess, a little bit of an excuse not to follow the mountain goats up the other side. But yeah, yeah. And how good was it that uh, there was a bit of noise going on? You could really sort of figure out that there's three or four here and get eyes on them and go right. That's not what we're after. Well, you saw some bloody beautiful heads. Yeah, we saw some awesome ones, man. Like the dudes I was with got pretty good self control because I. I could, to lug something out of there it would have had to been pretty good and everyone was on the same page so our standards were pretty high but it was quite cool to get the uh, you know you'd hear them go and then you'd spend quite a while trying to pinpoint them and then make sure that you looked over everything that you'd heard yeah to the best that you could nice so you, you've uh, driven up here flown up here flown up oh luxury yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the gear, how'd you get that here? So I was actually just talking about that. So we had uh, four or five like duffel bags full yep. of the gear. <laughs> Good yeah. thing about Marina, isn't it? Packs yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we were, yeah, we managed to get it under the 23 kg. Nice. So nice. tickety boot. How did how did you all get started in, in Marina? Like I, I've got um, one of the sick apex tops, which has a bit of Marina on it. And I had their first light pants for a while there, yep. but. Um, Seeky Country dealt to those, unfortunately. But yeah. uh, they, were, they were so good. Sun, cold, wet, you know, they're just... It's incredible what, stuff. What a fabric. And I've got the old Wolf Hider socks on at the moment. Oh, Marinos, yeah, cool. Got quite the comfy. N Mold NZ, Fitzy. Yeah, NZ Sock Company down there in Ashburton. Like, yep. how, do you, how do you get started on Merino, man? So we kind of identified a bit of a hole in the market mm. um, and we sort of just started up as a bit of a side project. Um, and a good excuse slash reason for us three to hang out and <laughs> like achieve something um, in the midst of that. So, how do you know each other to begin with? So I work with Noah, and then the other joker, Wado or Wade, Big Hosey. He's uh, <laughs> Noah's brother. Right. So, yeah. You're, you're the ringing. 
yeah, I was the scallywag that uh, was spending a fair bit of time in the mountains, so I was the I was the test dummy for the products. Yeah, and then you've then you've taken it on to the Tarawera for 100 miles. Yeah, yeah, the old 100 miler. What 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 vest did you have? Uh, yeah, and over the top. Nice. What were you carrying all your gears around? With? Uh Solomon Active yep. 12, like yep. Active Skin. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And how does, how does it, well, you know, it's still in one piece. How does it go underneath, something like that? Oh, it was pretty good, man. Like, I had, because um, Dan Jones, um, he was coaching me. Right. And then when he found out I wore this for the whole day, he was like, what are you doing, mate? And I'm like, mate, I just, I love being in them. And I, like, even in the summertime and when it's warm, oh, I still think they have a place. Yeah. Um, the guy who I ran with uh, two weekends ago, um, that's, that's what he was wearing for a good part of it. And then he's into the singlet, and the two of us, plenty of times, have just gone out. Like when we did Tongariro Crossing, you know, yeah. he he bought a merino top, and because we just going, oh, what should I buy? And I was like, well, merino is really good. It'll, if we get wet, it'll be okay. If, it, if it's too hot, it'll yeah, breathe. Yeah. Sure enough, we I'm just like, oh, this is great. And I've been on countless runs with him, and he's been rocking the merino top. Yeah, man, I'll, I'm a yeah, I'm a real big fan of it. Um, but Dan might have had a point because I did I. I made a mistake with my hydration throughout that race, and I like it was it was interesting because usually when you get dehydrated, yeah, you can feel it coming on. But I never really got to that point. But then when they put me on the scales at the end of the race, it was pretty clear that I hadn't got enough fluid in. How much weight did you lose? Ah, uh, six point nine. Jesus. Kgs. Yeah, because they're looking out for both things, aren't they? If you've put on a couple, more than a couple of kgs, they're a bit worried about you. And if yeah. you lose, yeah, beyond four, they're a bit worried about you. Yeah, so I stood on the scales at the end of it and she looked at me and she was like, like double take. She's like, is that right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's pretty close. And she's like, that's not good. Yeah. Um, she's like, wait here, I'll go get the doctor. So I just had to chill out and have some electrolytes and I think they might have checked my blood pressure and stuff like yeah, that. But yeah. yeah, it was pretty apparent I'd made a mistake with the hydration, but I mean, I can still finish. So. Yeah, yeah. So what what, what were you sort of rocking nutrition and hydration was it along there? So I definitely learnt some things along that um, race because I, I started off and I probably went too sugary mm-hmm. um, to too start early. with. Yeah. And then I got off that stuff pretty early, like a couple of hours, well, maybe five, six hours into it. I had to go to sort of savoury, mm-hmm. um, like whole foods. And then... Yeah, so I basically went to like sandwiches mm-hmm. and everything like that, but um, electrolyte pills. Yeah. Um, like, and I was also having Radix, like yep. um, at the major aid stations where the crew was, I'd smash down a Bricky or a smoothie. Yeah, that good too. Yeah, I found that pretty good, man, because it meant, because it was how, one. How big, a 500 or 800? Um, I think I was just doing the 600s, eh? Yeah, 600s, like, yeah. But to be fair, I don't think I was finishing them. I was more just like just hoovering a couple of good mouthfuls in and maybe smashing the smoothie and then peeling out of there because you don't want to waste too much time in the old... What's the, what's the smoothie coming in? In the pack, are you having to mix that up or...? I had a pretty epic support crew, man. Yeah. So they had like a fold-out camping table and I'd roll up and everything would be out. So I could basically go, yep, I feel like that, oh, I don't feel like that. So I had like a massive selection, and they they were just epic. Yeah, they stayed up all through the night to help me. And what made you choose to come up this way? What was that? What made you choose to come up to Tarawera? Um, probably just the atmosphere. Yeah. I wanted like a UTMB ticket sort of thing. Just brings lots of people along, eh? Yeah, and it's just I wanted to do one that had um, like a fair, fairly big atmosphere. Um, and yeah. that one definitely ticked the box because it got cancelled in 2022 and I was basically at taper. It yeah. was about three, three and a half weeks out that it got cancelled. So that was pretty brutal to restart the training for it. But Did you do lots of hunting after you taper? I did, man. Yeah, <laughs> I Feeling just, good? Yeah, 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 <laughs> I did. Went out hunting, but it was also like psychologically a little bit hard to... Yeah. To start up had to training. grieve it <laughs> yeah I know well so close like all the hard yak had been done so it's basically like pulling the gas off a wee bit just to you know recover for it and then they turned the tap off on it because we went into a lockdown and and uh, yeah that was all she wrote for that year but yeah managed to get done this year no niggles after 100 miles that's a long way man ah uh, yeah took, to be honest it took me a while to come right to be honest yeah yeah and did you do Crater the other day yeah, it did, yeah. Yeah? 
How was that? It was awesome. Yeah. I wouldn't say I'm super fit, um, but felt like it was a pretty good race and yeah. it's good fun, eh? They run a pretty good event down there, so it's pretty cool. How long have you been running like that? Uh, I think I started running in 2019. Yeah. I wanted to do a marathon, so I gave that a crack and it was a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like the first one, eh? Like, you've just got to fuck it up and yep. l- learn that, oh, yeah, no, I do need to drink a lot. I do need to eat a lot. Yeah. Like, I, I was trying to be, you know, sort of keto and, like you say, trying to get as many whole foods in and yep. like that. Whereas, you know, not that not that I've gone out and run 50 k's again, but even going like 20, 30 k's, it's like just get food, just get energy in. Totally, man. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and your joints are just so much better. Yeah, it's you got to feel the machine, eh? Mm. Um, yeah, you definitely have to feel the machine because that first marathon, I fucked it up big time, man. Like 28 k, I remember the wheels started to fall off, and I don't know what it was, whether I hadn't done enough long runs or whatever, but. Basically, I remember about 3K to go, man, and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get to the finish. What My legs are not working. Like, they are literally seized. Seized up. And my mates were waiting for me at the end because it was a Queenstown Marathon, so there was a few scallywags coming through. <laughs> and they were like, you were by far the worst shape that we saw come through. So I was happy to finish it, but I know it lit a bit of a fire to see, I guess, what I could do. But, like, you know... I'm not doing things fast, but yeah. I just enjoy doing it. As I was going to say, was it was it a pacing thing as well? Did you did you go for a hiss? Have a have a time in your head? Oh, I th- you thought yeah. you were chip choking. So I wanted I wanted to go like not as it's not a fast time at all, but I wanted to go sub three thirty. Yeah. Um, but when I was basically uh, stuck on the side of the course for a few minutes at a time, like I'd run a couple, like well, maybe get one or two k's, and then I'd have to stop, and have a wee breather. Yeah. So I blew that time out, but. Uh, it was cool just to get it done, and I think it sort of lit the fire. Yeah. The seeing what was above that 42 k mark. How, how does it influence your um, your balance when you're out hunting now? Like, you guys were in fielding for eight days. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah. You you said on the video you might have packed, packed a bit much. You had the hundred hundred liter. Was that right? Yeah. So I think I I probably packed about what is normal, mm-hmm. but the other lads they'd been in there before and they were super efficient about what they were packing so compared to what they had I was overweight but I, I guess in terms of um, are we talking spear gear or like yeah so things I probably wouldn't take things like which may be a mistake but I took rain pants and I yeah. never ever put them on we spent five days in the rain okay so, right yep um, so things like that but a lot of people you know that's a crucial bit of kit for them um, and I probably took too much food yeah <laughs> but they were laughing at me man because we'd get to a campsite and I'd be just shoveling radix out of my pack because I just because we had bad weather I didn't want to be sitting in the tent yeah hungry hungry like yeah. I just wanted to go to town on the food so that's why that's why I took heat in there yeah it's funny when you get to the, the end of we've even my little four-day mission into the res I like got oh, to man. the last day and and I sort of had um, like a chocolate. Oh, that's right. I had some cheese and crackers while I was out glassing. Yeah. Then I had dinner, and then I had a dessert, and I think I might have even had like a chocolate bar as <laughs> well. And I like went to bed like feeling sick. I was like, yeah. oh gosh. But it just because I didn't want to, didn't want to take it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it, man. It's a fine balance between um, going hungry and because if you're not feeling right over eight days, then it's going to affect what you can cover. Yeah. Um. So you want to make sure you're getting enough. And I'm. I'm just a hungry, scary big man, to be honest, and especially <laughs> like from training or anything like that. It's a yeah. bit of food. But um, how did your how did your pacing go? It was, it was lots mate? of fun. Eh? It was that was probably the most fun 24 k's I've ever run. It was because uh, you know he's he's done 76 k's already. So he, we do, we sort of we didn't really know how we were going to attack it. Like we went on a yeah. 20 somewhere between 20 and 25 k run a couple of weeks before, and oh cool, like. Um, we hit a big climb. It was the same amount of elevation that we were going to do, but a lot steeper. And I sort of walked that a bit. And then the next weekend, when I was down in Christchurch, I, I went up um, the bridle path. And again, that was quite quite steep. And yeah. I was like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. But that track around the headland is really nice. All good. Baby, baby sounds always yeah. good. Yeah, that'd be giving you trauma, is it? <sighs> a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> eh? It's like ha oh, oh. Yeah. Like three in the morning, you got a screamer. You yeah, and sort them out. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just we sort of 
he had been with a group yeah and so we left kinlock together and then i sort of led out to just try to like pull them back into like right we're running again here guys yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we got to the base of the hill and he sort of took the front and said you just stay in behind me and i think he must have put the blinkers on and i don't know what, what i've even talked about him talked to him about it but i think his decision was like i'm going to get away from this and i was sort of the barrier between it and from we, the group from the group oh, okay and we just started to pick off a few people along the track because there was the the 50k the 70k the 100k and then yeah. a relay that we're going going through there and yeah. it just sort of meant that you had little targets and we were going along at six minute k's there for a moment cool man and i was like geez i, I sort of checked because i had it on my phone and i sort of checked i was like oh we've done six k and then i checked my phone again and it was still six and i was like oh hang on mate we're going at six minute k's <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> clipping for uh for being that deep into 100k yeah so i, th I think i think the whole thing he averaged seven and a half and i think for that 24k we did about seven seven minutes that's pretty impressive on so average. You obviously you must have given them an extra gear like yeah and then that was the thing those guys all finished together about half an hour later and i was like oh that was that was quite interesting how like someone fresh someone just sort of mucking around and yeah you know i'd, I'd try to be funny i don't know what, if it, whether he heard anything or what but yeah he, d he just sort of was able to sort of keep going which was really impressive like to observe like knowing how he'd done 50ks in noosa in march had a tough time of it yeah, I'd done my one, and the last fifteen k has been pretty bloody horrible. To just yep. see someone just jog along, plod along, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. It's a cool that like it's such a cool sport, isn't it? Like I've I've done a fair few sports, like done motocross and mountain biking and stuff, and trail running is by far the best vibe and like yeah, uh, just culture. I reckon like everybody, it kind of changes from everybody being super competitive to people just being stoked. Oh yeah, on finishing. Yeah. So I think it sort of changes the environment of the whole, like the whole event, because yeah. it just, I don't know. As soon as you take that super competitive um, aspect out of it, it becomes a really like fun, enjoyable. And that's that's the crazy event. thing about events. Hey, there's like the guys that are sort of pro, and you know, I guess you have the same thing with with Ironman. You know, I think they had a lot of sort of ten or twenty pros there last year yeah. or this year. I can't remember what it was. And then there's then there's the field. And That's like, it. and it's the same. All those people that qualify for age age groups, and, and watching a couple of the ladies go over to Kona and race age groups. I, I remember a mate getting in in the like twenty to thirty age group, and I'm like, oh, how does that even work? What's that about? But then you yeah. like see the process, and you like gives you something to work towards. You know, you get to go to an international stage and like totally. you know, race, like, especially at Kona. Like, holy cow, that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that looks next level. <laughs> eh? That looks really cool. Yeah, and then on the other other spectrum, it would be interesting to watch Simon Cochran do the world champs of Ultraman. Like, that is just, it's just silly. Yeah, that's wild stuff, eh? I listened to that podcast, <laughs> well, the ones you've done with him, and that, he's a, he seems like a pretty cool dude, eh? Oh, they're just, they're just next level. And then back out ultras as well. Did you watch it during yeah, the week? Yeah, I did. Four um, days of, of going around in a circle? That's wild, man. The, the mental toughness of those jokers <laughs> must just be through the roof, man. Like, the psychology of just running that um, that loop, that continuous loop. Yeah, I think loop. it was about 70, 70 yards that done the height of Everest. Everest. So like sea level to the height. And a lot of those backyards are flat, but yeah. I didn't realise, because I think they alternate, they had two yeah, loops, right? Two so loops. they had a trail loop and maybe a road Yeah, loop. that was right, yeah. And when you throw an elevation, like maybe that's what tipped over some of those favourites, right? The elevation. Yeah, I think that was the case. Yeah. Um, just got the lads here. Just got the lads checking out the old skin. <laughs> you gotta be, you gotta be on on the podcast, boys. You're on the podcast, boys. <laughs> 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 Who figured it out? This this skin. I was I was saying to someone before that they're um, a lot of them are pretty good at cricket, but they have got questionable actions. <laughs> 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 the old Murley Dother and of deer. Yeah, it's no, I think I think they're more Bal Balinese than uh, than Sri Lankan. But yeah, that, that skin. Have you have you gone into those exotics? Into the what? The the, the, the samba and the rooster? Oh, I haven't, man. Like I guess that's the cool thing about hunting. There's lots of different avenues and different um, adventures that you can tick off. So like with hunting, your window for being able to do it is like very long. Yeah. So I, I'm in no rush to tick off everything. Yeah. That's why I was keen to wait till I was ready to get into the wild blocks, the and then probably the same with everything else. So I haven't even chased a seeker yet. Yeah. 
we had one organised a few years ago, but then the weather uh, uh, had um, other, you know, other, other ideas. Th- yeah, other ideas about that. So, yeah, yeah, at some point. Yeah, it's been it's almost sort of devastating driving like yesterday, driving into Topol and just seeing the Kaimanu was looking so beautiful. <laughs> I'm just like, fuck, it's going to work. Just the bluebird day, eh? Yeah. You just put the blinkers on, put the old sun visor over there just so it blocks out the range. Eh? Well, even <laughs> the last uh, month, flying down to Christchurch twice and just like flying over Nelson, flying over Marlborough, North Canterbury, oh, yeah. I'm just like, just let me out. I was the same a couple of years. I was, when I got back from Australia and we flew down to Queenstown and we... Yeah went over the green zone. I was like, can you just drop me out here? Yeah, <laughs> just, oh, I've got a parachute. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> just blow me out the exit. I'm good to go. You been in that country? Oh, I haven't. No? Nah. Yeah. There's, there's one mission in particular I, I want to do that's gone from the green zone into the Mavora Lakes and just like, oh, there's so many little oh, saddles and, and channels and river systems that you just look at on the topo maps and you're like, it's oh, just, there's got to be a way. It's endless, eh? Like, it is <laughs> literally, you could be going hunting like flat out non-stop for 20, 30 years and not, not cover take it. off what you want to take off. And it's not as though uh, New Zealand's a, a very large country, but the scope of missions and spots that we have to go is uh, yeah. it's pretty vast, really. Yeah, well, even, even my back doorstep, we've got um, Tere Raupanga on the Puriora's right there and then yeah. the North Puriora block. And then there's the Kaimanawas, and then I can come this way and go to the Kaimais or, or the little fellow blocks between here and, and Matamata. It's just like, far out. What, what, you know, you get a free weekend, and you go, oh, shit, what am I going to do? Yeah, well, <laughs> I know what you mean. Like, sometimes you're, like, sometimes you're stressing out because you're trying to work out what you're going to do, right? Yeah. And it's like, that's a pretty good problem to have. You're like, wow, am I going to go here? Am I going to go there? Am I going to do that? And it's a pretty good problem to have when you've got multiple options of cool uh, cool activities to go and blast out eh? yeah so me and Ryan Nicholson who lives in Carterton we're off yeah. on a hunt uh, in two weeks I think we're going to the Rohenis but <laughs> yeah we've driven like nailed it down he's like oh we could go to the car because you know like oh far out let's just decide on a spot I'll, yeah. st- I'll start uh, you know e-scouting he's getting the shit out of it and, and probably still like get there and go oh that's not as that's bigger than I thought it was <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's it but I guess um, some of the coolest missions are some of the ones that are a little bit spontaneous say eh, that you sort of make the make the day on the fly and yeah see see how it rolls out um, how do you how do you find do you stay in the Nelson region or do you go into North, North Canterbury when you hunt there I go into North Canterbury a wee bit but yeah. I've got a pretty good area of land that I like to get into and that um in the sort of Nelson Lakes area that's just I just love being there eh? it's one of my favourite spots on the planet like yeah I've done a wee bit of travelling and I just man I just love going in there I love driving down the valley like just looking up at the tops and so I was sort of still exploring around there but I'll get down North Canterbury um, yeah. every now and then as well and, and do you dive much into the management stuff that's going on around Nelson oh, I haven't really been involved yeah. in that stuff too much to be honest um, just trying to juggle time of everything, I yeah. guess, man. You're doing yeah. your bit. Get out there and uh, see if you can knock one over, you're helping, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, and we've seen an increase in numbers there, but um, not to the point where it's out of control at, mm. the, at the moment. But um, in some areas in North Canterbury, the, the numbers are pretty, pretty, pretty substantial. So up in those, like flying over that top country that's all been under snow, like... Does it green up pretty fast and, yeah, and so then burn off again? So the Molesworth in particular is a real, is a really interesting area because it looks when you fly over it, like from an aerial view, it's like looks very vast and yeah. like dry and barren. But when you get in there, there's just like when you get a little creek system that runs down a um, down like a tight gut or a little valley. Um, you just get these beautiful pockets of grass and it's just like magnets for the deer (laughs) and they're all like it's all through those areas so um, from a long way away it looks like it's very barren and some of it is barren but there's like beautiful pockets of um, green feed for the main they just thrive in there they get massive you had one of your videos a couple of years back you guys were sort of three or four spurs over and there's a big rock cliff in the middle of this face and then there's a little green gut and you watch the stag sort of just hang out there and stay there and then you crept on in, into them is, is that the sort of stuff get out the glass and let that do the walking and make it make a plan is yeah, it yeah well now now it's um so accessible to have pretty decent glass you can save a fair bit of walking because back when i started you'd be like 
You'd see something with the binos, a couple of K off, and the leagues would just have to do the um, do the glass and for here essentially. You'd have to walk over there and and um, just get in close to try and work it out. But now you can set a couple of K off and you can make assessments like reasonably accurate assessments. And yeah, yeah. And then and you got a good area for for the raw, or, or it's up up to up to the options, is it? Oh. For this coming row, I've hopefully uh, draw a whoppity ballot, man, because I'm addicted to that place now. I yep. knew I would be as soon as I got down there, and now that's sort of all I'm thinking about <laughs> yep. for the raw. So hopefully I can draw can draw a block. Do you dive into the history of it? A little bit, man. Like um, just more, just like the familiar areas, I mm-hmm. guess, and being able to like getting into the. Um, to the glaze knocks and stuff like that. It's mm. just like the history. We were we were up in the head of the Lockburn looking down into um, Wapiti River. Awesome. And just like, I oh know, it's just a, like a weird energy mm-hmm. you get when you're like looking down into something that's got a fair bit of history. Like you look over into Rum Gully and stuff like that and it's just different, eh? Yeah. Like we were up there and it was, um, it was clagged in on our side. Yeah. Um, so I just went over onto the top bridge without a rifle just to um, look down into the other block and it was like the cloud was breaking and, and lifting and you'd get like little glimpse down into Rum Gully and stuff. It was just unreal, eh? Yeah, and you guys hear him, hear him bugles. That's like, that's, that's the experience you go for, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Oh, especially up close. The first, the first one we heard, we walked a couple of hours um, up this route we sort of got to we're clearing um, in the bush and we looked up we could first see the tops and we looked up and we spotted a couple of bulls like you guys right off oh, that's a seeker yeah <laughs> Rocky the old seeker in the old field like, yeah. Rocky mate yeah. and um, and that was yeah we saw a couple and then we heard them bugle and it's just like aren't really the first time you boys. hear them yeah. yeah and then that was probably the most action we had to be <laughs> like we we got up there and we saw one nice bull and then we saw another nice bull. And we're like, crikey, boys. Yeah. Shit's on here. The big daddy's got to be somewhere. Yeah. And uh, we saw uh, we saw some other good animals. Um, it was, yeah, just a learning curve. To have you had, have, like you said, you ran into uh, Willie in the, at the urinal just there. <laughs> like, have you had some feedback on your videos, like what you left behind? Yeah. So, um, interesting old Roy Sloan, actually, I think he must have seen the video on... YouTube and um, or on Facebook or something, and he actually left a comment about something along the lines of uh, more people or well, people should check yeah. this video out because of the calls we made. Um, but we, to be honest, we probably made a bad call on a ball as well because my mate was uh, he was just keen on something old, mm-hmm. and we actually we saw a ball that turned out to be quite a lot older than mm-hmm. what we. Um, than what we thought, and is that your little glimpse on the on the clearing? Was it him? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I actually one of uh, a dude I know who's pretty experienced down there. He's like, "Hang on, mate! Like you let this ball go?" And we're like, "Oh, we thought he was young." And he's like, "No, nah, mate, that thing was old." Yeah, so you had a good mane on him, eh? But yeah, like in yeah. your video, you just had that little glimpse, and then and then you started, you know, saying, "This is where we are." And I was like, "Fuck." Oh damn! Is that all you got of them? Yeah, man. So it was just like little, little things like that. We've definitely, definitely learnt, um, you know, definitely learnt a few good bits of, of information and and learnt knowledge from it. Because one thing Roy was um, mentioning that it's very hard to uh, work out how much wapiti mm. an animal has in it just from its visual appearance. Yeah which I found pretty uh, surprising and interesting because my little knowledge, I was like, right, oh, big creamy ball, that yep. must be like full wop, like good to go. But it sounds like with DNA testing, um, yeah, the the visual indication is not as accurate as what you might think. Yeah, and, and reading the report that they released last week, I think it was, I was just saying, like, oh, we're still... We're still managed to pick off a couple of young ones and and like having read through Banwell's books talking about the expression of the antlers and, and yep. the sort of that level of maturity and then regression again it's kind of like you've really got to give them the chance especially in the wild to get that pain tray and then extend out the back and yeah and then for those to 
express his tines on the back. See, like, mm, yeah, yeah. And, and that's what like you guys were saying. It's tough being in there, and you see like four or five year old. He's he's starting to starting to get some shape to him, and you go, well, what's he like? Well, I think a good general rule of thumb is if you're not instantly yes. sold, if you're not like that's a shooter as soon as you spot out, like spot him or put eyes on him, then it's a pretty good indication that he's probably not what you're after. If you have to sit there for a couple of hours or a couple of days convincing yourself that this yeah. thing is worth putting on the ground, it's probably not the animal you're after. Yeah. Um, you know, you can usually tell by the body shape and and you've also you've got to be happy with the antlers too. Like if you're gonna carry that out, um, mm-hmm. you've got to be happy with the antlers and you've got to want to put it on your wall you've got to be proud of the animal that you take out of there as well so that also comes into it as well yeah and it's like anyone who lugs a head or a head skin out of there has put some serious work yeah like yeah. Uh, i guess the thing to remember with that place you know one of what well it is new zealand's only properly managed zone you know you don't need to worry about the management area you know, i think you know they're making that more commercial with with wild and stuff like that like yeah it's a pretty cool thing that they've started to develop in that. Like you say, Roy, you know, that he's there full time now driving this thing. It's pretty cool. And, like, that's the beauty of coming to a place like the Seeker Show, seeing some representative heads and going, oh, so that's that's what that looks like. That is the end destination. Like, you see some of the animals, like, some of the animals that we were seeing, it's like, man, if this was at home, like, if this was up around where I am, like, this thing would be in trouble. But it's yeah. just your whole. Your whole uh, thought process changes down there. Yeah. Um, well, one, of, one of the sort of posts I put on when I was doing the Wapiti series was like, we need to get those 100 inches back. And a lot of that comes at like length, you know, 50 yeah, inch yeah. long. Like, yeah. holy shit. And then length of time, like, and then spread. You know, there's yeah. so much that, that goes into that score. But yeah, it's just those little bits. Yeah. And, yeah. That's, and that's where the, the management's awesome because they're going to be able to feed on that. The genetics are there mostly, but it red influence now. But yeah, yeah, it's it's exciting stuff. And, and like the reports each year that come out of there, you're like, that's cool. Oh, it's so cool, man. And like the Kiwis, like you just be at night. And the last night we we didn't throw the tents up because it was just beautiful weather and we just slept outside. Slept under the stars. Yeah. And you've got uh, Wapiti's bugling and you've got Kiwis. Yeah, and it's like, man, this is pretty special. Like, we're on a pretty cool part of the world here. No menace with the Kias? They they visited you a couple of times? Um, uh, no, but I actually already had a bit of um, panel damage. Yeah, what was, with, what was with, the, with your pot lid? What was, were you trying to prevent some rain, really? Oh, yeah, it was basically me being unprepared, mate, to be honest. I, I gave my tent a bit of a, like, waterproofing before we come in. But I think my fly just has probably seen too many sunny days, mate, to be yeah. honest. And I had, we were up tar hunting and we got our fucking camp torn to pieces a few years back. <laughs> and I had a bit of panel damage from, um, from a mob of key, uh, Kias and, um, and I had some repairs done. What, what do you reckon the insurance company would say about that? I don't know if they Good Alpine tents <laughs> over $400. They're like... Oh, this, yeah, man. <laughs> but the, at the end of the day, you're up in, you're up in the Kia's environment, right? Yeah. So you've just got to deal with it. Um, Force of nature, I think that one's called. Yeah, it was funny, man, <laughs> because there was three of us in this uh, tar block. And we had a we had a pretty big evening. One of the mates shot a really nice ball, and we come back, um, we come back on dark. And I got back to camp, and I went to undo my uh, vestibule, and about four Kia's... <laughs> come out of the door and I was like well this isn't good they gave you the this isn't where I parked my car <laughs> yeah <laughs> so basically we did some assess like whip around the tent and I was like they've run a mark they've just basically stand on the top of it and just sunk their beak through the top um, and then one of the other boys Curly his tent had been done over too but um, Mikey the other lad the third lad he had been left untouched um, and then the next <laughs> the next day he, we went down and recovered his ball, and then he basically spent the afternoon just having a bit of a chill one, and he was doing a bit of sunbathing. You know, he's pretty stoked with the ball, so he's kind of just relaxing and enjoying the evening. Yeah. And he said the Kia's turned up, and he was sort of like frantically running around doing a bit of Kia patrol, just trying to shoo them away a wee bit from his tent. And then he turned around, and one was on top of his tent, and just like before he could shoot away, it just Whack. went just sunk the beak down into the 
the other oh, to the right. death. They've obviously yeah. had some type of success doing that with something. Well, I think um, I think these were like quite juvenile, yeah, um, like younger kids, and they were just young fellas up to no good. You know, they had some energy. I tell you that <laughs> free. <laughs> they were into it, man. But um, again, we're in the environment. Um, it's just part of it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jared. You, I better let you get back over to your stand, seeing as the Siki calling's going on. They'll, yeah. they'll, be, they'll be right beside you, so yeah, yeah, you'll hopefully be chocker. So thanks very much, mate. You, did, good, you did well for your first podcast. Cool, man. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers, buddy.